This is exciting. I can see the participants all signing in. It's great to see everyone. Um, oh wow, it's going it's going up really, really fast. This is great. Um, hi everyone. I'm Kimberly McIntosh and I'm the senior policy officer at the Renemy Trust. And thank you for joining us for our webinar today, Beyond Statues and Symbols, Where Next for Teaching Colonial History. Um, and as I can see from the tally just going up and up and up, um, we've had such a great response to this event. Um, let's see how many people are tuned in. Oh, it's just gone in over 100, which is great, and it's still going up. Um, we've had so much enthusiasm for this event. We've had over 500 people register and lots more people who have shown an interest but can't make it today, um, especially on a day that is as hot as this. We're really, really excited and happy for everyone to have taken the time to join us. So at Rennie Mead, we've been working on the issue of teaching inclusive and diverse histories for about 10 years in various guises. And this work has included research, workshops with young people, collecting oral histories, creating resources to support teachers, and our, our migration story project with the universities of Manchester and Cambridge. And we couldn't have done any of that work without Professor Clara Alexander, who's going to be our first speaker um, and our other colleague, Sandeep, who I'm not sure if she's able to tune in today, but um, has done so much to advance this work. So as you can imagine, we've been really inspired by the energy and momentum in wanting to teach black histories, migration, colonialism, that's been sparked by the resurgence in global Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Um, it inspired us and the colleagues at the Institute of Historical Research to start a new campaign with other partners called Hashtag Teach Race Migration Empire, um, which has actions for supporters and people who want to get involved and campaign on this issue. Um, so if you follow the hashtag and also sign up to our newsletter, you can get more updates on this work. But we did feel that the conversation was being pushed a little bit off course, um, away from structural change that we need to see um, and into a culture war conversation about statues and symbols and away from what needs to happen in schools to the curriculum and to teacher training in order to see the changes that we all want. So today we're gonna to hear from some experts in migration and empire history, um, from teaching and from campaigning um, to tell us what's missing from the curriculum, the barriers to teaching these histories in our classrooms, strategies for change, and how you can all support campaigns for curriculum change as well. So we're going to hear from Professor Claire Alexander from the University of Manchester, Catherine Byrne, who is the Deputy President of the Historical Association, Hannah Cusworth, who is the Subject Leader for History at the Charter School in East Dulwich, and Lavinia Stennett, who's the Director of the Black Curriculum, who has signed in just in time. It's great to see you, Lavinia. Welcome, Hi. welcome, hello. Um, and so to kick off, I'm going to start with Professor Claire Alexander, who is Professor of Sociology at the University of Manchester. She works on race, ethnicity, migration, and youth in Britain. And Claire is the Director of Research for the School of Social Sciences and Associate Director of the Centre on Dynamics of Ethnicity. And she's going to discuss the work Manchester and Rennie Mead have done on migration histories, what the barriers to making change are, and what she believes should happen next to move these campaigns forward. Um, and just before she begins, um, I'd like to add that we have a Q&A function. So if you have questions, you can pop them in the Q&A chat um, and we'll have a section at the end where we can field questions and get them answered. But over to Claire. Thank you, Kim. Um, so first, let me thank Kim for inviting me to speak today and to all of you for um, taking time out to come and, and join us. Um, so I've been invited to speak today about the work that we've been doing with Runnymede for the last 10 years or so, and Kim has been brilliant in supporting that in the last couple of years. And I think the interest in today's event shows the kind of level of engagement and concerns around history and racial inequality in Britain and how those things are connected. And certainly, as Kim was saying, history is absolutely at the front of the kind of what we think of as the culture wars, particularly in the wake of Black Lives Matter and the pandemic. So I'm going to um, make five very brief points in the time allotted, and I'm not going to have a chance to say anything very nuanced or subtle. So I'm going to be provocative rather than reasoned, perhaps. Um, but I wanted to, to start by just giving you a bit of background to the work that we've been doing with Runnymede over the last 10 years. So these are this is me and my colleagues. So starting with Debbie Weeks-Bernard, 
uh, Sandeep Lida and Malachi uh, McIntosh, who both led on the Our Migration Story work and did a fabulous job with that. Um, so you'll kind of see the basis on which we're drawing, I'm drawing these kind of thoughts. So I've been working with Ronnie for, yeah, about 10, 11 years on developing a more inclusive curriculum. Um, and the work started with our Bangla Stories website, which is a beautiful thing, um, which was designed by Bastiana Belfort when she was at Runmead. Um, and there we used oral and family histories to explore the history of Muslim migration um, in the state of uh, Bengal and also from the state of Bengal to the UK. And what we wanted to do there was make these kind of very big histories of um, partition, climate change, displacement, civil war, um, movement and settlement visible and um, immediate people through quite little histories of the voices and experiences of families and people and communities. So from there we took the family histories uh, into British classrooms in schools in Sheffield, Cardiff and Leicester and we basically asked uh, young people to do their own family and community research so we kind of set them off with, with cameras and tape recorders to speak to their grandmothers and things. Um, we followed this up with a project then with teachers uh, in London and Manchester to look at the idea of heritage and place because one of the things the first project showed was that all the young people, no matter where they came from, were very committed to their kind of their city, their neighbourhood, their, you know, where they belong kind of locally. So we were trying to encourage young people to explore those neighbourhoods and the everyday streets, houses, estates, shops, churches, mosques and so on that had been shaped through migration and the presence of ethnic minorities. And those two projects, if you're interested in that work, can be seen on the um, Running Mead um, Making Histories website. And there's some great um, work that the, the young people produce on that. Um, I should also say that all of this work was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, who've just been amazing in supporting this over the last decade. So we learned two things from these projects. Firstly, that there was a massive amount of enthusiasm from young people of all backgrounds and ethnicities in history. So what we found before was that young people tend not to choose history. Young um, ethnic minority people tend not to choose history. Um, but they were very keen on doing history if they could see themselves reflected, if they could see it, it was relevant to them in particular places through them, through their families or through the places that they lived. And secondly, and I'm sure if any of you are teachers that have um, signed in today, you're going to recognize my next point, that we found that the teachers that we worked with were incredibly keen to do this work, but they were also really worried about getting it wrong. And they were also just really busy all the time, so needed support in terms of resources and training. So that's where we um, developed the Our Migration Story project from. It was a plea from one of our teachers that we'd worked with saying, you know, this stuff is great, but if, if I can't just download the lesson plans, I'm going to just teach Henry VIII. Um, so what we did was we brought together over 80 academics, archives, museums and local historians who gave us their resources and we built it into what we think of as a kind of one-stop shop, kind of hub for teachers who want to teach the history of Britain uh, in a more inclusive way. So the history of Britain as a story of over 2000 years of migration. So we worked with, I think, probably around 500 young people, teachers and schools across the country. We did teacher surveys. Um, we collaborated with examples, the school's history project, a whole range of people. So it didn't come out of nothing. And from that work, I'm going to just draw the kind of five following lessons and they're all quite short. So the first one is that the struggle today to develop an inclusive history curriculum isn't new. Um, it's really important that we recognise that there's been a lot of amazing work done over at least the last 50 years. Um, so we can see this in the work of historians like Peter Fryer, so his day in power that came out in the mid-1980s, or Rosita Vizram's Ayers, Lascars and um, Prince's also published in the 1980s. And they were crucial in opening up these stories of the Black and Asian presence in Britain um, for a number of years. And we can point to the work of the Black and Asian Studies Association, people like um, Marika Sherwood and Haki Maddy, who've been active in that space since at least the 1990s and have been incredible in laying that groundwork. Or we can look further back to the work of supplementary schools from the 1960s onwards, which sought to fill the gaps in mainstream education. Or Bernard Cord's book, um, How the West Indian Child is Made Educationally Subnormal in the British School System, uh, which was published in 1971, so nearly 50 years ago, which called for black studies to be taught in schools to challenge educational underachievement and challenge stereotypes. Or we can think of the activists who initiated Black History Month 30 plus years ago. 
So I think it's really important to recognize that the history of the struggle for black histories in the UK um, is there and to think about how we can acknowledge that, how we learn from that and how we build on that. My second lesson is, again, that black and Asian histories are not hidden. So one of the most important lessons we learned from the Making Histories project and the um, OMS work was that contrary to what people always say about black and Asian histories, they're not actually hard to find, they're there everywhere in our stately homes, in our ordinary homes. So if you think of the legacy of British slave ownership project, you know, you can look up your street and find out which of your, those properties on your street um, were bought through the profits of slavery. Um, you can do the same thing around colonialism. The museums are filled with looted artifacts. We can think about the struggles of black people in the Chartist movement or black and Asian women in the suffragette movement or the trades union movement. So there's huge numbers of really incredibly rich resources everywhere. So for us, the task in OMS was not actually to find that, but just to bring them together and make them accessible to teachers and to pupils. And we were incredibly lucky that so many people and institutions were willing to give us access to their work and their resources. And it, was, it was incredible. So not teaching Black and Asian histories is not due to lack of access or visibility or presence. I would say it's an act of willed ignorance and erasure. My third point is that black histories are not one thing. So I think it's really important that we recognize the specificity of what black British history looks like from a British standpoint. And a few little kind of sub points here. Firstly, um, so these histories, black histories in Britain itself, precede slavery by 1500 years and precede Windrush by around 2000 years. The second point is that the history of race in Britain can't simply be told in Britain. It's a global story linked to issues of slavery and empire. So um, here, and the history here is shaped by the histories there. So I'm thinking of that kind of uh, Stuart Hall quote, we, were, we are here because you were there, which kind of sums up those connections. And the third point is that the history of Britain's black and Asian communities are completely intertwined and inseparable. Um, so we can think, as Stuart Hall talks about the kind of cup of tea as the, the icon of the British identity, where you think how those different histories are connected around where tea is grown, where sugar comes from, and so on. So the struggle for racial justice across the past 70 years is a shared one. So for me, and this might show my age, I think, more than anything, um, it, Black is an inclusive category. It includes a whole range of different histories that should be considered alongside, alongside each other. Fourthly, it's not just what you teach. It's the way that you teach it. And I think that I'm sure that um, my colleagues will have more to say on this. So I'm going to just say that one of the things that we learned that was really clear was that where they do appear, black history is often taught really, really badly. Um, and the work that Running Me did with Tide on teaching empire and migration um, capture some of those tensions. And, and actually uh, Nadina Doherty's work on Black History Month, um, for those of you that are interested, has some absolutely hair-raising examples about how not to teach black histories. Um, our teacher survey showed that teachers are still uncomfortable teaching difficult histories and this is an issue which runs from school through universities through teacher training and then back into schools in a, in a bit of a vicious cycle and I don't think of getting more black and Asian teachers although I think that's important um, there's no reason why white teachers can't teach black histories and get it right it's a matter of training, it's a matter of support, it's a matter of monitoring and you know, correcting that when there are problems. And it's a matter of taking race and racism seriously. So that's, and that's not a teacher problem, that's a national problem. And my last point um, is that black histories are British histories. So my final point that I wanna make is it's really important that we don't see black histories as separate from or supplementary to or an add on to uh, British histories. Black histories are not an option. And there are three quick points to make here. Um, someone said to me a few years ago that, that um, developing an inclusive curriculum, this was in politics, not history, was a way of making certain groups feel better about themselves. It's not about making certain groups feel better about themselves. It's not about self-esteem. It's about knowledge and recognition. Uh, secondly, and relatedly, they're therefore relevant to everyone. Where, no matter where you are in the UK, no matter what kind of school you go to, or whether there are any ethnic minorities in your area, this is a history that is part of everyone's history. And thirdly, if we argue, as we have done, that black history is British history, 
It also follows that British history is also black history. So the history of Henry VIII, of the English Civil War, I grew up in uh, Oxfordshire where the Civil War is kind of all around us, you know. Um, the Armada, all of these things are part of my history as a Briton and a Briton of colour. Just as the history of slavery, of empire, of colonisation, of the struggle for independence and decolonisation are part of the history of white British people. So a recognition of what British history is, is crucial not only to understanding who we were and where we are now, but also what our future, what our shared future looks like. So history matters. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Claire. And I just think it was really helpful to have um, the evidence outlined that really shows how long people have been campaigning on these issues, that these aren't new. And for people campaigning now, particularly young people, that there's a plethora of knowledge and experience that can be drawn on when we're thinking about how we want to take these campaigns forward. Um, but also the framing that these are the histories of our nation for everyone. This isn't just about a Black History Month, and this isn't about specific histories for specific groups. This is our national story. And at the moment, we're telling an incomplete story. So thank you, Claire, for really emphasizing that. Next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Catherine Byrne, who is the Associate Professor of History Education at the University of Oxford, and also the Deputy President of the Historical Association. And oh, you've got a share screen for us. So let's go ahead, Catherine. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kim. That's that's really helpful. And thanks, Claire, for just fabulous um, introduction to all, all the issues. Um, I've been asked to talk about what's possible within the current curriculum, given the realities of classroom practice. And obviously, Hannah will talk more about that um, and also think about the role that historical institutions can play in particularly training. And, and I mean, Claire's given um, you know, huge uh, examples of the, the significant work over time. Um, I want to start with the, the national curriculum, partly because, I mean, those in schools will know, you know, what it says. Um, those outside, it, it's worth kind of being clear about um, what the national curriculum actually says and working from its kind of purpose um, statements. And at a time when Ofsted has said we're really focusing on curriculum and, and schools intent, actually going back to what the, what the curriculum is expected to do, and particularly that last um, phrase in, in the dark green about the complexities um, of people's lives, the process of change, the diversity of societies, relationships between different groups, as well as their own identity, that the, the national curriculum, which is often seen as a barrier, I think in, in its purpose statement is really making um, lots of things possible for us. I also wanted to just pick up the curriculum across all the key stages, because if we're thinking about steps forward, I mean, any look at the key stage one curriculum, which is about changes in changes within living memory and then significant changes further back, significant individuals in the past who contributed to national and international achievements. I mean, Claire has made um, that case really powerfully about, um, you know, British history is black history and that the space there and significant historical events, including in their locality. And I mean, it's, it, you know, that interesting challenge about um, how we properly look at Britain's interaction with the world. Well, we, you can do it by, by starting local. And there were, you know, the beautiful examples that, that Claire began with. So for those who are thinking about what to do, there may be things, you know, if you're teachers further up, you can do in your own schools, or if you're academics, it's, it's not only thinking about older students, there is perhaps most scope actually um, with very young students, you very young children, if, and if we get that right, the potential and the appetite for history and continuing to study in school may change. Key stage two can feel very depressing, but it comes back to actually paying attention to the black presence in Britain's earlier history. It is very, very strongly this kind of narrow um, nation for many of its units, um, but so that, that that important thinking about how, you know, the presence in Britain. But again, there is scope and um, the local history study, I've already mentioned at Key Stage 1, it's there again at Key Stage 2. Um, the thematic study and certainly 
schools that had um, begun to look at what was a, a unit in the 2007 curriculum and, uh, about the movement and settlement of peoples and why these movements, you know, why were we there and you here, that those, those patterns that, that began to be established in, in uh, that, you know, that curriculum. Schools can continue that within the thematic study um, at Key Stage 2 and the potential is there also there at Key Stage 3. There are distinct and specific instructions to, to look at particular non-British societies um, within the curriculum, but, but thinking about um, where uh, schools choose in order to build, to build on it later. So there is scope um, within Key Stage 2, or that, that perhaps feels like um, the, the hardest. And at Key Stage 3, and this is where I just wanted to put up, this is what the curriculum says. This is all the prescribed content there is. So it's really echoing Claire's point that the possibilities to study that the histories that we want to include are there. There is nothing beyond that, as stated on the screen there, that is statutory. The only single topic you must teach is the Holocaust. That's the only thing. Every other example is exemplary and not, uh, you know, not a requirement for teachers. Much depends on how it's interpreted, but the scope is there. When we get to GCSE, and this is where I think teach, you know, the, the what can we do, a lot of it is about movement within the exam boards, because then things get determined by not only the broad title of the unit, but the detailed content of the specification. And, you know, there are some teachers, I was talking to some um, on Saturday in History Secondary Committee that says, I don't care that they've turned the history of medicine into British medicine um, and thereby ruled out the whole Islamic uh, contribution in the Middle Ages, which was at least in previous textbooks, I'm going to teach it anyway. But it's actually quite a brave teacher who will do that, given how crowded the curriculum is. So the real scope at the moment it, it are the two units, one in AQA, which is more widely defined about Britain, the world, migration, empires and the people. O OCR, it's more narrow, it's migrants to Britain, and I think that has, has its own problems. Um, but we do know that Edexcel is, is looking to, to introduce a migration unit. So that movement to um, particular modules is possible. I'm not going to dwell on, on all the others. There are issues about you know, what, which topics you choose and how broad the whole curriculum is. Um, but I will uh, point out, uh, you know, OCRB does, does give scope again for local style. I keep coming back to local possibilities if you've got nowhere else to do it by being able to choose your own local site and that, you know, the work that the National Trust has done, for example, on, on colonial countryside and, and the history of those houses. Um, the, 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 the scope to which it's being taken up is problematic. Only about 4%, you know, so far have taken the migration module, but that, that pressure to move. Um, similarly, uh, you know, at A level, there's, there's a much broader range, but actually I've made myself go back and look at the range of topics again as they're listed. And the whole list is pretty depressing. Um, the, the, there, are, there is scope, but often things are defined in, in very difficult ways. And why we're allowed to look at race relations in America but not in Britain and actually look at the history of racism or anti-racism within the curriculum. There are serious problems um, within the curriculum, um, but there are, you know, significant steps forward and, and uh, you know, the African kingdoms and the work that Toby Green particularly has done to make that available. Um, but again, issues about teacher take up. I'll flag up again the, the scope for young people themselves and if we can you know make history attractive enough to get them into a level actually the scope within the non-examined assessment for students to pursue their own interests there are possibilities there both looking at interpretations and in some boards looking at um, you know sources students own use of sources in terms of the reality this is data from the ha survey um, before COVID, what, what is a constraint on teachers? And the red bits are, are the, the teachers saying we're really concerned about this. So teachers are concerned, you know, 40% of them are, are struggling with budget cuts and around 40% are saying the access to continuing professional development is really difficult for me. So those are their biggest concerns. If I'm going to change my curriculum, will I get access to the support that I need? Um, in terms of what teachers are doing, therefore, the teachers who are making changes, it's mainly at Key Stage 3, 
but there is a movement to switch modules within their GCSE or A-level, or in some cases to switch boards, but it's usually switching modules. So there's a lot of interest in Edexcel, which is one of the most common boards, you know, taking, introducing a migration unit. To make that possible, and I'm sure Hannah will talk about this, it's hard often to persuade senior managers, especially under pressure, to give them funds or to see that change is necessary. Why should we change? We're getting good results. Don't change it now. Teachers will have to learn new stuff. You'll have to build new resources um, and actually getting together to build a case for change. Um, so Hugh Richards was talking at HA Secondary Committee about liaising with Hannah to say, how do we make the case um, in, in your particular school? SHP is, is, has said, we're going to support teachers in doing collaborative planning. If that's within the migration study, that scope. But COVID has brought online opportunities. And so I've just you know, given examples there. Nick Dennis organised work with Toby Green and, and um, Trevor Getz to say, let's, let's build teachers' knowledge um, and, and equip them to move. Um, running seminars with um, Royal Holloway University um, to build teachers' knowledge, the use of the National Teacher Learning Day um, this year. Justice to History running series of, of webinars that, that become possible for more teachers because of the situation that we're in. And the Claire mentioned the Tide Runnymede um, Trust, the HA Teacher Fellowships, trying to do new forms of extended um, professional learning for teachers that build um, subject knowledge along with thinking about pedagogy and how do we teach this and getting to grips with some of the uncomfortable issues. So various kinds of more extended um, CPD programmes. Um, you may not be able to see all those examples of teaching history, but um, as one of my other jobs is to edit teaching history, all those um, copies show examples of where teachers have made changes um, and their reflections on those changes. And they've done it by collaborating with historians to show how historians have researched these topics and why they matter to them. Um, they've created and then shared resources. So there's a lot of work on, on sharing what people have done, particularly with Black Tudors. Um, I'm gonna come back to students. Catherine Priggs, her, her very recent article was actually about if we offer opportunities for young people themselves to talk about the curriculum they've studied, particularly when we give them some different input and then see what they have to say about it. They, that is critical to any decolonizing um, endeavor is that we actually involve young people themselves and respond to it. And critical work in lobbying the exam boards is really important. In terms of institutions, and teacher training. Um, just to say, I think joined up lobbying is really important. The, the institutions named there are trying to work together. And, and I realise we need to make a clear statement about the fact that we are working together in both sort of lobbying and trying to be constructive with exam boards and saying, look, if you want historians to advise you about um, Black Tudors or how you could improve your 17th century um, units so that they are um, you know, acknowledge the history that's there, we can provide that expertise. Um, Runnymede has, has got new funding to do more research. Um, the HA does its, its regular survey about establishing what teachers' needs are, and often it's the feeling uncomfortable. Um, it, sometimes it is the resources, sometimes it's the support to make a case to challenge um, senior leadership teams or academy structures. I've mentioned um, universities are key to those teacher fellowship or the extended models. So TIDE, um, the involvement of the University of Liverpool and their, their research project in, in, in the fellowship that continued, or um, AHRC impact funding um, is often a key way forward, but the, the fellowship that the HA ran about teaching the transatlantic slave trade and, and Britain using the, the legacies of slave trade material, those, those kind of initiatives. Um, podcasts, MOOCs, webinars, universities making their, their knowledge available. There is a campaign, um, uh, Jason Todd's been helping to kind of coordinate um, that and it has had some press coverage about we need a center to pull this together. Holocaust education has done it really well, a research-based center in terms of what do young people and what do teachers know and need is, is really important. But local collaborations are also really valuable. Universities, history departments, working with PGCE 
providers. It's easier for university providers. If there are, if there are academics out there, it's harder to work with school-centred schemes, but they do bring together collections of teachers in training. The last thing I'd say, having just met my own PGC cohort this morning and just hearing about the range of things that they have studied is a kind of plea to teachers. Actually, the, the, the resources that, that young teachers are bringing in because of the, the history they are studying means that they have scope to really help us, but we need to give them opportunities and obviously support to plan, but sometimes schools curricula are so tight, they don't use the knowledge and expertise that teachers have. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was a really helpful outline of some of the um, structural barriers within the curriculum and also in schools and in institutions, which make it difficult to make change, but also the actual quite large scope that there is within the curriculum to teach quite a range of histories. Um, and that it's actually some of the structural barriers um, outside of the curriculum that make that difficult. Um, and that is also the perfect segue to introduce Hannah Cusworth, who is subject leader for history at the Charter School in East Dulwich. She's going to talk a bit about um, what it's like from a teacher's perspective um, and someone who's really been highly involved in teaching these histories and making changes in her school. So welcome, Hannah. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, so I think I'm gonna talk about uh, a couple of things. I think the first thing is I'm gonna kind of give you a sense of what we what we do at our school and then a sense of maybe what some of the, the, the like challenges are. And I think Catherine's already talk, talked about those. Um, so maybe I'll come at it from a kind of more personal perspective. And then I'll end by thinking um, or kind of talking a little bit about maybe some suggestions if, if there's teachers in the audience who are thinking about adding uh, or trying to kind of yeah include some more of these histories into their curriculum. So to give a little bit of context about my school, when I joined, we only had year seven, eight and nine. So the first three years of secondary school. And that meant that we were like a small and growing school that didn't have um, like a, almost like a legacy curriculum, which I think has been really essential to us being able Able to include these histories into our curriculum because I think now we're a much bigger school it feels really hard it feels much harder to make change and so I think that's maybe one of the challenges that I'll talk about but I think I should sort of begin by acknowledging that I feel like maybe I come from a relatively unique context and then in thinking about maybe the demographic of our school um, it's about sort of 50 50 um, white British and then uh, BME with a, a large portion of our students from black uh, Caribbean and then black African backgrounds and then lots of other different ethnicities and a big kind of thing uh, I suppose like a, a value of our school or a kind of focus of our school is being on a community school so we have a really small catchment area um, and so the students are very local and so there is a big focus on kind of honoring the community and it, and, it, and it kind of reflecting the community and I think that's also been really helpful when I've tried to push for um, changes to the curriculum. So in terms of what we teach I think maybe I'll just kind of talk about when I joined the school there was definitely um, we taught about empire or that was definitely the plan because we we hadn't even taught year the third year of secondary school year nine yet um but we decided or i we kind of i worked with my line manager and we were like we really want a uh, a kind of inquiry a topic that looks at um really migration to britain with a focus on the sort of windrush generation so post-1945 migration from the empire to britain and the experiences of those people and so I, uh, I went to a CPD day and there was a, a professor there from Birmingham who said, well, obviously the history of black people in Britain didn't begin with the Windrush. And I was like absolutely blown away by this because because my my um, like family are part of the Windrush generation, so I'd always seen the the beginning of Black history in Britain being post 1945. Um, even though that's mental, because I just that summer read um, Miranda Kaufman's book on Black Tudors, so I was like, so I know that's not true because I because I've I've read the book right, but even so, I was blown away by that statement. So that completely changed how I thought about our curriculum. I was like, it's not enough for us just to do this kind of end of key stage three, end of year nine thing about uh, the Windrush generation. We have to start threading Black history and Imperial history right back through the curriculum. 
And I think a big focus for our school now is it's so important that the first time that our students come into or experience black people or people of color in the classroom, it's not um, through the lens of slavery. And I think that there, that is a thing that I think if you look at the survey of schools across the country, um, while there's change and while there's lots of schools doing great things, I think most children probably encounter black history first and foremost through the lens of slavery. And that was something we really wanted to not do. So we then started to think about, well, what can we bring in, in, in earlier in the curriculum? So we started thinking about bringing in um, black Tudors and talking about um, John Blank and his story of being a trumpeter in Henry VIII's court. And um, what we then realized by bringing in some of those stories, for example, the one of Diego, who was, um, who was a kind of an assistant to Francis Drake, who traveled with him around the world. Another example of a black Tudor is you can, just like Claire was saying, right, you can bring in so much richness and those stories really help illuminate the broader kind of story, British story you're trying to tell. But we kind of felt like that wasn't enough. We then we also thought about bringing in a scheme of work about Mansa Musa. Um, so talking about Africa pre kind of colonization. And so that's been really important to us. And so how I kind of we look at it at our school is it's we try and weave um, black history and history of empire into everything that we do, if at all possible. Like, um, because as Claire says, once you start looking, it's everywhere. Like you literally can't unsee. Like once I start looking, I realize like, oh, I could add this in, I could add this in. So we try and weave it in throughout. But we then also have some, what we call inquiries, like topics where they are really just focused on a question to do with um, black history or empire. So at the moment we are teaching an inquiry um, that we kind of came up with with a group of other teachers, which is just when was the British Empire? And it's looking at the change of, and continuity and the nature of the British Empire. And we do that in year nine. But um, we also have tried hard to bring it, not just for those first three years, but then also later. So into GCSE um, and then into A-level. And for GCSE, we do the Empire and Migration Unit, but it's a really small take up. And most schools, I think, do maybe Power and the People, or I think the most popular choice is, is medicine. Um, and then recently, we've, um, we've put together a proposal, which the school have accepted, um, about changing our A-level syllabus. So our sister school does a really successful A-level where they get amazing results, and they do Tudors, um, Russia, um, thinking about like the revolution and, and Stalin and then they do coursework um, which I think is about decolonization in Africa but we just felt for, for our school we wanted to um, kind of bring black history and empire history more to the fore so we are going to be doing um, the African kingdoms paper with um, it's with the OCR but I think it's maybe us and maybe one or two other schools across the country who do that paper so our school was quite hesitant because they were like, well, the other school gets really good results. Is this, a, not, this is quite scary, right? Like doing this thing that not that many other people do. Like, how are you going to resource it? How are you going to ensure that your kids are going to get really good grades? So we put together quite a strong, um, well, hopefully, well, they accepted it, so strong proposal. Um, we're then going to look at civil rights in America, but I completely see, um, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Catherine or um, Claire's point, about we obviously don't just want to see civil rights as a British thing, uh, sorry, as an American thing. So we're also going to do our coursework, we think, on British sort of protest movements and look at uh, anti-racism struggles um, as one example of something that students could do. So we tried quite hard to kind of bring it along through the curriculum. Um, but there are still loads of challenges. And uh, I've talked about one, I suppose, in the context of the A-level, but there's also just challenges in terms of subject knowledge. Um, and today I was teaching that when was the British Empire uh, unit. And I realized that in order to do this well, as a teacher, you kind of need to know at least a thousand years of history, of global history, in a relatively large amount of detail because you want to do these topics justice. Like if I get something a little bit wrong about like King John and the, King John and the Magna Carta, I kind of like, okay, obviously it's not ideal, but I don't feel, um, I don't feel like number one mortified about it. And number two is if that's going to be really problematic. I'll, but if I get a, something to do with kind of black history or empire history wrong, I feel like that has the potential to be really harmful. So I think I see um, that yes, te all teachers can teach this, but it, it is really challenging and having something like a center, I think is really important to support teachers with that, with that subject knowledge. Um, 
I think just like teacher time um, and is, is especially at the moment when people are having to do more like duties around school, having to support students um, with COVID. I think time is huge and, and it's going to be really um, stretched, especially this year. So it'll be interesting to see kind of there's a lot of energy, but whether teachers have the time to kind of build on that, um, I think is going to be is going to be a real struggle. So I think um, I just want to finish by thinking about strategies. I think start small. Um, so like we started with that, just that one kind of Windrush unit and that sparked so much, so much more. So I think don't beat yourself up if you can't throw up, you know, rip up your whole curriculum and plan something completely from scratch. Like do something small, do it well. Um, and when, when I say do it well, I think use the history that's there and use the scholarship that's there um, and base it on um, a historian that has really looked in detail um, at uh, a kind of issue in, in black history. I think I, when I've seen it go wrong, it's when people have these kind of really broad um, inquiries on, or they end up doing something like, let's compare how bad it was for black people in the UK to black people in the US. Um, and I can see where people are coming from from that, but number one, I don't necessarily know it's a historical, like a historical question. It's more maybe like a political or a moral question. Um, and I, and I think that you're also going to end up not basing it on current scholarship potentially. So I don't think those are the kind of questions that historians are asking. So Catherine talked about looking at the historical association and their publication teaching history. And increasingly there's, uh, there's some obviously in past issues, but I think increasingly they're looking at issues of around teaching um, race, migration, um, get involved in um, what the HA are doing or what the school's history project are doing, because there's a lot of people out there that are so willing and so excited about this to kind of support teachers who are a bit more uncertain or are maybe are facing pushback from their schools. Um, and I'll end there. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Hannah. I think that was so useful to get the perspective of a teacher and also have some practical advice for teachers who want to start making changes in their schools, kind of where they can start and then having it grow from there. So thank you. And my final panelist is Lavinia Stennett. She is the director of the Black Curriculum. Um, and it's great to have her here and also to just see how much the Black Curriculum has grown in the past year since um, I first met Lavinia. It's just going from strength to strength, um, has some very cool ambassadors, including Virgil Abloh. So. I think it's just incredible and I'm really excited to hear um, about what you guys are up to, what you've got planned and also how um, particularly young people who want to get involved in campaigning around this issue can get involved. Great, thank you so much Kimberly for setting this up and always creating the space for us to engage. Um, so yeah, for those that are not sure about the Black Curriculum, we are a social enterprise that campaigns but also teaches um, Black history and supports the teaching of Black history through programmes um, that um, are delivered into schools. For, so, for example, school workshops and also um, CPD teacher training programmes. So the reason um, I set up the Black Curriculum last year was because um, in my experience of learning African history, I came to a point of just, just understanding that there is just so much that I, I don't know and we don't know as people, um, Black people, Asian people, white people um, around African histories, um, particularly um, the histories of black people of African descent in the UK. Um, and that's a problem because a lot of our students and the students that we've connected with have said that it impairs their sense of connecting um, to other people. So being able to actually forge deep connections that are sustainable for the future. Um, it limits their opportunities um, and also their confidence to actually um, understand and see themselves as part of a wider society. So by inserting black histories into the curriculum, um, we yeah we're campaigning and we're also making progress towards making sure that young people see themselves so representation but they're also very, they're very much thinking critically about the world around them and i think that point is really important um because a lot of the history that we're learning it's almost as fact it's it's taught in a way where it's um yeah it's, it's happened and history is a process it's always unraveling we are part of that process and so it's important that young people actually can see themselves understand how they are connected to those events um so it's not for example your tutors your stewards and now here we are today it's how do how do those events connect to where we are as a society as a society but also as young people so um yeah last year we basically done a lot of um focus groups with, with young people, also students um, in higher education to actually understand the issue a little bit better because um, we all were very passionate about the problem but we wanted to kind of find out how can we actually 
you know, make some steps towards actually bringing a curriculum into schools. Um, so one, we had to understand the school structure. Um, two, we actually had to understand what, what young people want to learn. Um, and quite frankly, it's really hard to ask young people what they want to learn when they don't know any part of black history. Um, so for us, we had to take a perspective of, um, I guess, coming in from, um, yeah, from a place of, 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 of recognizing that this issue is so broad um, and therefore the kind of things that young people um, should be exposed to and the things that they were saying that they were interested in were very broad and those issues were um, events in history but also iconic figures as well so on our curriculum um, it's thematic so it doesn't kind of fit within the, the standard traditional kind of national curriculum framework it is very thematic so um, we deliver sessions like art history which are broken down into um, yeah, sessions like music. Um, so we have the history of um, reggae calypso um, and what that meant for Britain and people in Britain politically and socially during the 70s and the 80s. Um, we also have events such as Grenfell in our land and the environment module, which basically explores how black people are connected to the land. Um, and for us, it's just really trying to identify the ways in which, um, I guess, yeah, our current day society is very much linked to um, the issues that we see appear time and time again so um this happened last year and i think like with yeah with yeah with the, the ongoing issue of run rush and um the constant dehumanization of black people in britain today it was really important that we make these current day connections to an issue that has been on yeah that's been existing within us within our society since the onset of european colonialism so it, it's such a huge issue and I think like everyone here has pointed towards that that it has to be a unified effort um, so we have made connections with a lot of people um, to make sure that we are making sure that yeah we're making steps that are clear-cut um, I think it was yeah December December 2019 um, that we met with the curriculum team in the DfE to really speak about what kind of you know progress they're, they're thinking about making in terms of the national curriculum um, and how they plan to actually I guess take a more critical perspective of what's actually being taught. Um, they were supportive of the work of the Black Curriculum, the vision, which is to improve the sense of identity in all young people across the UK. Um, but they said they can't support us because they don't have any power and they need um, the support of ministers. So your Nick Gibbs, your Gavin Williamson's, um, to make sure that that you know that that change is actually made. So um, with the death of George Floyd, we just felt that there was a, it was a poignant time. Um, I think after collectively struggling through coronavirus as a society, grieving um, and having that period of self-isolation, literally and also emotionally, um, it, it felt very, it weighed heavy on our hearts to actually want to do something that um, incorporated many people um, across society to make sure that curriculum change is it's not something we're fighting for in a silo, but it includes everybody. Um, so we, we created this campaign called TBH365, which stands for Teach Black History. Um, and also to be honest, so playing on that theme of if we're not honest about what the problem is, we're not gonna make any kind of progress towards the solution. Um, and yeah, that was targeted towards um, uh, Gavin Williamson, but Nick Gibb responded and basically said the curriculum is bored, balanced and flexible, which we know it's not. Um, and Catherine has shown us how, how that is not the case. Um, and then we received a second letter that basically said that, okay, we kind of acknowledge your work, but at the same time, um, we don't have the time to meet and talk about these discussions. So I think in terms of the challenges that we're facing, I wouldn't say the government is a challenge because we have circumnavigated the government in our work and we don't really need the government to make um, changes in society. But I, I think that it's really important that they are, they are making sure that symbolically, um, yeah, black history is on the curriculum and teachers actually can be able to identify periods in black history so that, that they are, are encouraged to be able to do it. But in terms of actually delivering the work, um, I think it does come down to, yeah, it does come down to teachers. It comes down to what students are also asking for. So coming back to the idea of youth movements, I think it's really important that we're actively seeking out the visions of young people and seeing what they want to learn, um, identifying the points in which they actually feel uncomfortable and those things that they don't enjoy learning because it's not good enough for us to be teaching histories that young people can't connect with. Um, and I mean that in the way where they're actually in class and they're seeing teachers, um, for example, deliver a history and it's not connected to them. They can't, um, they can't actually interact with that knowledge. I think it's important for young people to have that sense of this is my learning and we're all sharing it. It's our learning as a society. Um, so it's 
about seeking that from young people and seeing how they enjoy interacting. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a challenge, I think, just working with schools around the UK, um, which is okay now that it's online, because we're doing a lot more um, online um, CPD trainings and also delivering workshops for schools. But I think, yeah, one of the other challenges is making sure that teachers are accountable because it's good that they do the training, but then what happens after six months down the line, how are you ensuring that longevity how are you ensuring longevity and making sure that black history is actually embedded um, in your curriculums? And I think that's the challenge that we don't have that, I guess, that, that, that audit or level of accountability. And I think that's a wider kind of issue that we should all be focusing on um, and supporting teachers as well in that too. Um, I think someone else mentioned that there are resources. There's a lot of resources out there. We have resources um, that are not only just books, but also, um, online digital things that young people can actually see visually and connect with because learning in school is great but for example you might have students that get excluded early or students who because of um, systemic racism within the school environment are not they're not going to pay attention in class and they're not feeling like the learning is connected to them so it's how do we make sure that the resources and the things that we're giving to young people um, are relevant to them and they are also accessible so I think it's yeah it's it's about yeah, it is about that kind of wider provision of resources. Um, and lastly, um, we at the Black Curriculum are about black histories. Um, so it is um, black in the sense of, of African descent. And I think with, um, yeah, with the death of George Floyd and also the just constant oppression of black people in UK society, um, speaking about black is not a problem. I think we have to address it um, to be able to remedy the problem. And by starting at the premise of be, yeah, being able to deliver histories predominantly about the histories of black people in the UK gives us a sense of, um, I guess, yeah, it's a first step towards reconciling black history as British history, which it is. So um, yeah, there's a lot of fantastic work happening. And yeah, it's a privilege to be a part of the space. I'm just really excited because I know there's a lot of progress that's gonna be happening over the next year um, and beyond that. But yeah, there's, I think there's a, a, a raised awareness and now it is, I guess, as a society, continuing that pressure and placing pressure at the right people at the right moments um, and supporting youth movement. So I um, just wanna shed light on Rerooted who are a youth-led campaign um, from the Advocacy Academy. Um, and also, I've forgotten the other, the other campaign. Um, it slipped me, but yeah, there's a sister campaign um, also under the Advocacy Academy that are um, also campaigning to do some great work around curriculum reform. So yeah, I think just, yeah, continuing with that, that sentiment of supporting young people and hearing their voices is absolutely critical because without it, it's not relevant. So yeah. Thank you, Lavinia. And I agree. I think it's really, really important to involve and incorporate a lot of the um, self-organized youth-led movements that have um, existed both before um, the resurgence in Black Lives Matter demonstrations, like um, Fill in the Blanks, I think it's the other one, um, Rerooted, um, and also newer movements as well. So um, All Black Lives is a youth-led movement, and they're also calling for curriculum change as well. So I think it's really important that we're all kind of working together in the same ecosystem. Um, and also the point about making history is relevant. And I think that kind of builds on Claire saying earlier, talking about work that she had done on local histories and place and can, making those connections between, um, yeah, people's personal lives um, and the wider story of our country. Um, so thank you everyone so much for coming. It's now the um, Q&A section and I've got a couple of questions through already that I'll feed to the panel. Um, and please do feed any more in that you have. Um, so I'll start with the first question, um, which I think could go out to everyone. Um, just from a sixth form student um, who wants to know about the best way to push his school to change their history curriculum so that it can be more inclusive. Um, if anyone would like to take that. Um, I think it's probably building um, a show of support among the students in the school. Um, and even if it, it's you and a small group of friends, just coming together and expressing maybe in a letter or asking for a meeting where you can sit down, it might be the head of history, it might be um, your head teacher, to really outline why it's really important 
to you and how it affects you personally, maybe, and um, emotionally to not see some of those histories represented in the classroom. I think so many teachers are really passionate about this, um, but sometimes they do need a bit of a nudge maybe to put it to the top of the priority list. Um, so that's what I would probably say. If, if a student came to me and they could put forward a really compelling case about why something should be, I would be like absolutely so keen to do it because I'd be so impressed with them for coming to me and having the kind of courage to do that and putting together like an argument that it would definitely push it to the kind of top of my priority list. Um, I, I just wanted to add to that. I was talking to a teacher, I mean, actually a teacher in Bristol who their, their school has been approached by ex students, you know, sometimes from some distance back, um, writing to the school in, in, in response to the you know, events over, over the summer. Um, and I've really encouraged her to, to follow that up. You know, they've written a letter, actually um, get, get the evidence, you know, not only from the current students, but also from ex-students who, who actually talk about this, you know, wh where has my education got me and, and why does it matter to me now? And so I think, you know, if you can make, make common cause with, um, uh, you know, those who've been through school or, you know, moved on, why does, it, why does it continue to matter to them as a foundation? I mean, the other thing I would say is, that, and it's kind of why I put the purpose of the national curriculum up there. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not an advocate of the curriculum um, as it is, but there is lots of scope there. Um, I, I think I would disagree with Lavinia. I think Gib is right. I mean, I, I, I'm appalled by lots of things that have been done, but actually the curriculum as officially stated does give lots of flexibility, but teachers need to take it. And I think because the idea of, you know, are you meeting the objectives that your curriculum needs to serve, which is what Ofsted is pushing on, actually challenging teachers and saying, this is the intention that every curriculum must serve. You can deviate from the curriculum if you're an academy anyway. You don't have to follow the national curriculum at all. You have to have the same kind of scope. And if you can tie your demands to that statement of what a good curriculum should do, and I think there's you know, lots in that statement that will allow you to make the case. Would anyone else like to come in on that before I bring in the next two, which I think are linked? Okay, great. So I've got a couple of kind of um, teacher and teacher training related questions that I thought I'd bring in. Um, so Tom has a question, which is what sort of advice would you have for teacher trainers going into schools that might have quite rigid curriculums? Um, and how can providers support new teachers who might have ideas, but their departments can't or won't listen to them? Um. Yeah, and, and, and it, it, is, it is really difficult. And, um, you know, I say that as, you know, <laughs> negotiate, meeting to negotiate with my own mentors on, on Thursday. And um, certainly, you know, as a provider, we've, we've had, I mean, we've kind of made it very explicit in our, partnership arrangements that one of the assignments we have in, in our program is that our trainees should be able to plan, teach and evaluate a scheme of work. So it may only be one, but often that, you know, that has been really powerful and it picks up on Hannah's point about starting small. So if they have to teach the Second World War, but, but give them space, therefore, to look at it properly as a global war, or look at its, its impact, um, uh, you know, in, in relation to, to uh, um, you know, for former colonies and, and the movement for independence or whatever it might be, but that, that scope. So we have tried to negotiate in sort of small, but highly specific ways that say learning to plan. And, and that's the other thing that learning to plan is one of the teacher standards and you must give space and scope for teachers to do that. It's, it's often not comfortable and there is a real concern about, well, we've worked out our curriculum and you've got to um, work in this way, but actually to say you're, you know, you're kind of not compliant with what the course is, um, is, is trying to do. Was there another half to that question? I've kind of lost the other. Um, I'll see if anyone else wants to. No, I think you know that does cover both sections of the question. Did anyone else have anything that they wanted to add in response to Tom? Yeah, I'll add. Um, so I think with rigid curriculums, it is a case of just kind of like looking at what is possible with within that rigidity. Um, a lot of the time, I think there is like um, a, a fear that if you don't have any explicit examples of Black history, you can't insert it. Um, 
at, on the current curriculum, you are kind of encouraged to teach the transatlantic slave trade. And I think within that, you, you do have some kind of room to insert some criticality in there and actually get young people to think about why the transatlantic slave trade was started, who was it started by, and actually kind of get them to think about um, the, 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 be the, when I say the benefits, the economic benefits that came back to Britain, and, and also thinking about specific examples of how that was um, not a pleasant experience for people who were formerly colonized. So I think within that, before you even start to like unpick and start to just like rewire the whole curriculum, there is, there is a beauty in starting with those hard and uncomfortable parts of history. Um, and also I think becoming very comfortable with this idea that you, you can't automatically become, I guess, like um, a, a decolonized person. Like you have to be able to be racially literate and with any kind of literacy it is a case of, um, it is, yeah, it is an ongoing process and you will have to kind of become very comfortable with learning new language and learning new ways of kind of um, unpicking, unpicking um, things that you think are, are truths um, and understanding how that sits with, with people. So I think it's not an automatic process that happens and you have to become very willing to be open to that um, as a teacher, as an individual. So I think there's two sides to it, starting with what you have, but also realizing that you also can, um, you also can start that journey of becoming racially literate or um i guess decolonized in, in the broader sense of its term yeah right um so i've got a couple of questions um about the english curriculum um that i will combine so um quite a few people are saying that they're english teachers um and they'd quite like to bring in black histories um into the english curriculum and if there are any suggestions um on how to do that um there is also another question here that I think would be good for Claire to come in on. Um, is there um, not a danger in potentially or unintentionally re-perpetuating um, a divide and conquer method if we focus on only reforming how British history is taught without looking holistically at British history's connection with other former colonial countries and how that unites many in a common cause. Um, so if I start um, with the English curriculum and then move on to that question of um, how we can teach colonial histories in a um, global and connected way. Can I offer a very small suggestion? It's one of the things we do in our in our PGCE programme, and, it, and it's to pick up on the kind of, uh, you know, I am a historian really, so I'm picking up on the overlap between the history and the English curriculum, and so many schools do First World War poetry. So we have an interdisciplinary session with our history and our, uh, our English trainees, where we actually look at, you know, if, if, if you're going to do poetry, who, who, which poets and from where um, are, are you looking? And, and so we, you know, take, take that area. Um, uh, Jason Todd has done fantastic work on that. It's my colleague and I'm feeling really bad that I should be able to uh, lay my hands on his work, but, but I can happily um, provide references to that because we we re it's, it is that to kind of seize you know Lavinia's point about seize the opportunities where they exist and that's one where we've really tried to challenge it and say actually you're looking at such a kind of small group of uh, you know essentially middle class men as even you know well, what working class what is he looking at and then from from where which which forces who, who fought in this campaign um, are you looking at Um, let me try and say something about the, the second question. I mean, the thing, the English, I don't know much about the English curriculum, but the Bank with Stories project that we started off with actually fed into the English curriculum. And I think there's something about stories and voices and possibly through the use of English language, the development of English language. I remember doing a, a, a my undergrad, undergraduate degree was in English uh, literature and language. I did something on black English, whether black English was a language or not. Uh, so I think there are ways in which there are all ways of, which that can be taught in a more creative way, um, possibly more easily even than the history curriculum. Um, I think it's really important, and I've said this a number of times, I think it's really important that we connect up those histories. So the history of empire, imperial kind of connections. So, you know, so you've got people that come to Britain at around the same time and have a whole series of kind of shared struggles, um, particularly through the kind of 50s, 60s and 70s into the 80s. But I mean, of course, those histories are longer histories of connection. So, you know, there are 
there are reasons why there are big Asian communities in Kenya and you know that then get forced out there are movement of plantation owners from the Caribbean to India to Indigo you know there's a whole bunch of kind of the opium wars I mean all this stuff is around connections which are all centered through the, the kind of role of the British Empire so I think it's really important that all of those stories get told so it's not a divide and conquer thing it's not one which says you know this this history is important this history is not important there are connections too with I mean the reason we chose to do our migration story through the lens of migration rather than race was because you, there's a whole series of fascinating kind of interweaving stories, connections between the Caribbean and Ireland and those kinds of things that you can tell through the story of migration and it takes, it allows people to see themselves in those stories in ways that are quite unexpected. The other thing I think is worth thinking about is that classrooms in the UK now, so what something like 28% of kids in state schools are non-white of a whole range of different backgrounds but those those communities are changing really quickly really dramatically and it's also about how one adapts to those kind of broader histories um, and broader experiences that those those young people are bringing with them that are quite quite different to the ones we always think of in relation to kind of black and asian history so i think that yeah i think it's about connecting those stories up so you put a lot of different stories alongside each other in the classroom and people will start to say oh yeah that's quite like my story or that was quite like my family or that and then you get that strong sense of a shared identity. The other thing I want to say about the, the earlier conversation as well about um, what people should do in schools and if they're confronting rich, I mean I, I think all that advice was really brilliant but I'm a big fan of anyone that knows people say know this, big stick. So I think unless we force people to take this stuff more seriously as a top-down thing, to, to insist that migration history, um, black histories, however one wants to define those, are taught and that needs to come from the top and it doesn't so it shouldn't be about whether you think your school is mixed enough to have to do this it should be that any school that you go to should be taught this it should be taught this all the way through in a very similar way so I, i'm a big fan of you know that's where the the structure needs to come from we you know if you're going to have a national curriculum let's make it a national curriculum and let's make sure everybody's doing it let's not let academies opt out and private schools opt out and you know and let's make it a national curriculum that is reflective of the nation. So that's my rant over. <laughs> um, that kind of builds on that someone in here has asked um, Stephen about um, teachers and students outside of London, um, particularly where um, there are a lot of non-black students and um, kind of how uh, teachers can deal with those challenges um, and how we can make the case in those schools and there is another question um, from uh, Elaine um, who teaches in a majority white fairly privileged primary school in West London um, and is worried about the response um, potentially also from parents saying that it's um, too young a uh, time to discuss topics such as racism, um, Windrush and the bad treatment of people from different backgrounds and if anyone has any advice on kind of countering those claims um, if they're faced with them. One of the schools we worked with um, in the Making Histories project was a, a mainly white school in South London. Um, I think it might have been in, even in Greenwich. So, um, and we had real trouble with some of the students that didn't want to engage with what we were doing because they would say, well, my history is not interesting. I'm, you know, I'm, because I'm white and I'm English, I, my history, I don't have a history. It's not an interesting history. <clears throat> and when we got them to start looking at the question of kind of family histories, very often they came from a family that at some point, you know, a generation or a couple of generations back had some kind of migration history. And then you could see the way which they were able to engage with that kind of same shared set of, you know, this is, this is what it means. So I, I think, and I think Catherine made this point, local histories, family histories, community histories, allow people an insertion point which doesn't seem alien and, and you know I mean none of us have any connection with the Tudors at all unless you're Daddy Dyer right none of us have any but we're force-fed that kind of constant you know rhetoric and diet we all know all of Henry VIII's wife but it has no connection to us so mm. I think there's there's a way in which local history is the way that history gets taught so it's not even just content it's how history gets taught which I always think of history as, a, as being like a detective story right you should be able to go and discover those stories for yourself not just be given a whole series of facts which you're expected to just kind of learn and then repeat in exams so i think there's something about 
history methods that allow for those shared stories and spaces and take away I think some of the fear that, that students and, and teachers as well have around whether they're going to say the wrong thing so I think there are points of insight and if you do it early on so Running Me developed a, a fabulous site called Romans Revealed um, which was aimed at primary school kids I'm sure there's other great resources as well but that's about a kind of detective story about you know here, here are these remains what do we know one of them is the ivory bangle maybe um, so it teaches you the science, it teaches you the history, and it also normalizes the fact that at this point in the Romans, there were people of color in, you know, living in England who were high status. So I think there's a way in which if you build it in early, it takes away some of that kind of fear and, um, and discomfort. Hannah, you had something as well. Yeah, I think it was just to build on the local, the local history point. So, um, so obviously I teach in, in a in a school with quite a, a black kind of um, demographic and also in London. So I think I almost, I don't know, in a fun, funny sort of way, I almost think I have the easiest job, but I think the more I read about black history, the more I realize that it is everywhere, like especially in places you might not expect it. So like Gloucester, because of its connection to Bristol, I would never think of Gloucester as being a place where there's a lot of black history. But if you read Miranda Kaufman's Black Tudors, or um, as soon as you start getting into that, um, that more kind of local history, you realize that there's a huge amount of stories that you can tell about, um, about black people who uh, came to Bristol and then were moved and worked in sort of um, as servants or um, in slightly more kind of like challenging circumstances, like, you know, circumstances, but in places you wouldn't expect. I think similarly, if you go to somewhere like Liverpool, you also see that that has got a really long history of having a black community. Um, and I think there's been like an amazing project done in Hull um, which again, I wouldn't necessarily think of being a place um, with a kind of long black history. Um, I think it's also about, as Claire has, has like said, this isn't just about black history. Like this is actually very much British history. And if you think that Britain had an empire for so long, it's almost impossible to teach any British history after about I don't know, 1600, without bumping into the histories of non-white people and of empire, because it's just, it's in everything, like really traditional topics, World War One, World War Two, And we, I think there has been a lot of erasure um, and the resources are there, the historians are doing the work, the, the kind of historical groups are doing the work, but it has, that has been erased in our popular culture. Um, but you can, you can find it, and even just starting with something like David Olashoga's Black and British, it just brought to me so many stories, um, even about my, I grew up in Brighton, and I thought that was an incredibly white place. But the more I read, the more I realized, obviously it wasn't, right? Because it was a kind of, it was like a metropole. So you had huge numbers of people from Africa, from Asia coming through from the sort of 1700s onwards. So teaching it through the local history, I think maybe is a way when you've got a, a demographic that isn't kind of majority black, teaching it through the local and you'll be surprised at how many local stories there are, I think is a really powerful way of doing this that maybe doesn't feel so threatening. Um, and maybe doesn't feel like you're trying to shoehorn in black history when your your demographic isn't is like white working class, for example. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of opportunities when you connect local histories. Um, and one of the things that we've been able to explore through our workshops outside of schools um, in the Springboard program is getting objects in. So, for example, the, the rich history of mahogany, um, that was a, a theme that we explored with um, an American artist called Cameron Rowlands, but it gave young people the opportunity to actually learn how mahogany was used in the slave trade um, and how that connects to certain parts of Britain. And I think, like, even without being in the center of London, you still have very rich objects. Like for example, up in Glasgow, you have buildings. I know Tony Walker does some really, like really interesting walks, for example, that visually allow young people to actually see these things. And I think that gives, yeah, that gives a connection again, without having to, as Hannah said, shoehorn it in class, but you're actually bringing young people outdoors and connecting objects to them so that they can actually start to identify these pieces of history without having to be in London necessarily or in other major cities like Manchester or Birmingham because yeah I think they, they need it the most like we have it here we have a lot of um, museums and um, I guess just research archives like the Huntleys but we we can't expect I guess for us yeah to have this all this history and, and other people in in towns like Shrewsbury um connect with this information when it just doesn't have any relevance to them so yeah I think there's other ways to kind of get young people and teachers involved 
do outside of the classroom. Great, so sadly we are starting to get towards the end of the session. So I'm going to bring in a couple of questions and kind of group them into, because a lot of them are kind of thematically related. Um, so we've got some that relate to kind of structural barriers in schools um, and what teachers can do. Um, so Tracy has asked about um, kind of how we can disrupt um, the circle of the most popular GCSE choices being the same every year. Uh, Germany, Russia, etc., and the number of textbooks that are then printed because of that, um, and how um, what can teachers do to kind of um, disrupt that cycle? And there is a um, another question that's related to that um, about what teachers can do um, when they are struggling with lack of funding, etc., um, to make long-term systemic change. And then we have another question about the role of museums. Um, how we can bring in museums into the conversation um, when we're talking about curriculum change. Um, and a final question um, related to teacher training um, and teachers being adult learners. Um, and whilst we're kind of waiting for more funding um, for teachers, specific teacher training, kind of what opportunities um, exist for teachers um, who have a congested curriculum um, but want to learn more about diverse histories. And I'll leave it there. Huge, huge agenda there. I mean, I think the just on the structural point, the 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 driving influence on curriculum, certainly in secondary schools, is undoubtedly GCSE, and there are huge problems there and th currently there is no sign from the government and that's where I think Lavinia is absolutely right government is really critical because of the subject criteria that then determine everything else and, and what the exam boards do um, and that's why the organizations that I mentioned are, are trying to join up to to campaign together but I think um, you know, teacher lobbying, and if you've got ex student, it, it is it is that is a kind of contact your MP um, type letter, as well as keep badgering the exam boards. Um, that 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 needs to be a kind of joined up pressure. Um, Siobhan Dickens at Cambridge, who's done has done some research about you know how do you shift the curriculum? You know, talks about kind of top down and bottom up, and both have to happen. So teachers building their confidence, and that's why I would say if your school doesn't let you teach migration because you can't afford to make changes um, there. You can do a module in key stage three that is within the national curriculum. You're expected to do a thematic study. So build up your expertise by teaching it at a level that you can, um, you know, build up that knowledge. So you would, um, you know, get, get to be in a position to change or, uh, you know, the collaboration. I mean, the, the, the concern is, is teach, I mean, teachers need sustained support. I think going online makes lots of things possible. So the HA is running a, a series of webinars um, done by um, Justice to History, looking at different aspects of decolonizing. And you can, you know, join all five and they're, you know, held after school and you can, um, you know, then view them back at your own time that trying to fit around the limited time that teachers have. But what we do know about CPD is that it, it has to be sustained one off events won't make a difference so you know find a group of people to collaborate with or commit to a series or you know work with a podcast or you know it's it's that commitment to a specific change but where you can get sustained support i think is really important i mean just to say that i think this is a really interesting moment because i think you're starting to get a lot of quite joined up um, activities working together. So the exam boards, I mean, you said this, Catherine, but the exam boards are starting to look at how they can change their curriculum, um, not in terms of just adding new modules, but also how they teach the stuff that we thought we knew, right, the students. So I think there is, there are spaces where, and that's happening, the, the work of the Royal Historical Society, the, the, the Historical Association, they're really important um, levers that we can push. So I'm mean, sorry, I think, I mean, and the stuff that Lavinia and those other kind of the Advocacy Academy and all those other organisations doing are brilliant. So there really is a, a fresh 
pressure from both sides, but museums are interested. We worked with a number of museums on um, the, our migration story site, and they've got loads of great resources that they're also putting online, and they're, they're dealing with and struggling with all those kind of questions and wanting to make that uh, more accessible too. So I think there is a real potential shift, uh, which I, I think is probably new. <laughs> so I'm hopeful that actually we might actually get some real change from it. I'm just going to come in because I've seen um, a question like what is the role of parents and I think that's a really important question because yeah it's it, yeah, I think with, with, with understanding how we are engaged with young people it's not a case of leaving it to teachers and that the work doesn't happen at home I think parents also have a vital role in their children's education and I, I understand the fear and I, I, I definitely can empathize with the idea of um, I guess, destroying a young person's, I guess, vision of the world, um, especially if they are young. But at the same time, we live in a world that is unequal and they experience it, they see it, and they soak these things in. My niece is three years old. Um, and sometimes we will just like watch YouTube videos and sometimes she will pick like, for example, a lighter skinned um, dance choreography to watch. Um, and when I put on the other one, she'd be like, put, put it back on. So I think already like she started to make those decisions that we would call like unconscious, but it's very conscious. And I think as, as parents, we, and we are not a parent yet, but um, parents have a duty to be able to um, provide honest education to their young people. Um, and that does come through resources. It actually does come also through asking the teachers in the schools what, what they are doing as well. Sometimes we hear it the, the other way that, um, yeah, teachers say that parents are not happy, but what are parents doing to also ensure that the school is pushing forward um, a curriculum that is representative and is honest as well about British history more accurately. So I think there's two sides to the coin here. Um, and I know there's some parents that also homeschool and there's a lot of information online as to like how parents specifically can access resources that they can take in. Um, so I think it's called the Black Child Agenda, but there's, there's a few kind of pages out there that I think would be beneficial to, to parents um and obviously like self-promotion but the black curriculum also has resources on instagram and things like that to help um parents actually start that initial conversation um and i think yeah that's that's really where it starts is at home um and we can't ignore the role um, that parents play in, in children's education for sure yeah. um i think i just wanted to come in i saw someone um talking about how sometimes this can be a real struggle and staff can can uh, in schools or in kind of like people more generally pushing for change is really hard and sometimes it can be really challenging like I've definitely experienced it as a teacher teaching um, these histories and have found it myself quite emotionally uh, tough I think um, like thinking one thing that really got me last year was thinking about the number of students who really their only example of maybe black history is is slavery but like how many black teachers especially for teachers of Caribbean descent do we have teaching that history in the classroom um, and I couldn't really think of that many and I thought it, like how kind of but when I teach about slavery I, I talk about I put it in kind of my own like personal context and my family context and I thought like how kind of sad is it that we don't have more uh, teachers like history teachers of color um, and students don't get to kind of be taught by um, by people of color um, but also how kind of draining it can be I know from speaking to other history teachers they feel such a burden and if there's any kind of one kind of out there um, Sorry, it's got, probably got a train going past. Sorry, that's really noisy. Um, like, look after yourselves, like build connections with other people, um, join in different groups because it, it can be really exhausting and feeling like you're doing this on your own. Um, but like reach out to people, get support, like vent. If you're like having a really difficult time with your school or, or kind of as a governor, like don't keep it all in because I think it will, it will kind of consume you, like find groups, find friends and be like honest about your experiences with people that you kind of feel safe with because um, there's a lot of work to do and the journey is quite long and sometimes it can be, it can be really tough. And I think we don't really, I think always talk enough about the emotional side of, of this um, from the perspective of people who are kind of, uh, pushing for change or teachers in schools who are kind of trying to get things changed in their curriculum. Thank you. I think that's a really perfect place to end. Um, I can see that um, there's a lot of really helpful advice being given in the chat function. So I just wanted to flag that
um, we can download the chat function and then kind of pull out some of the advice and send that round to all the attendees afterwards. Um, someone's also said in the chat function that it would be helpful to have information of how parents could campaign. So we can take that back and think about how we could maybe put together some resources to do that. And I think the Black Curriculum also has some resources on how to do that. Is that true, Lavinia? Yeah. Yeah, but um, in October we'll be ramping the website. So yeah, October. Wonderful. Um, I'd just like to plug um, our campaign, hashtag Teach Race and Migration Empire. So follow that, sign up um, to our newsletter and we have a blog that will circulate as well that has some actions that people can take if they want to carry on having this conversation or campaigning either whether they're local MP, um, writing a letter to Nick Gibb, writing to their school governors, um, seen some advice in the chat for governors as well so we can share that. Um, but just thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, we hope that you'll continue to follow all the different campaign work going on in this area and to get involved as well. Um, we just hope that you have a wonderful evening. This is my last day at the Running Me Trust, so I can't think of a better way to end my time after three and a half years. So thank you for joining and hopefully see you all soon.